Reading through the Bible in one year, July 26th, Judges 9, Acts 13, Jeremiah 22, and Mark chapter 8. And Abimelech, which you remember, means son of the king. The son of Jerubal, who is Gideon, who said, I won't be your king. God is your king. And then he acted like a king. Went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and spoke to them and to the whole clan of the household of his mother's father, saying, Speak now in the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem. That's where he lived. Which is better for you that 70 men, all the sons of Jerubal, rule over you, or that one man rule over you. Also, remember that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf, and the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem. And they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our relative. Also, having seventy kings is kind of a bummer. They gave him seventy pieces of silver from the house of baal Bareth, from which Abimelech um, hired worthless and reckless fellows that followed him. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jerubbaal, seventy men on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbaal, was left, for he hid himself. All the men of Shechem and all Beth Milo assembled together, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar which was in Shechem. Again, they did this on their own without seeking the Lord. Now, when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and called out. Thus he said to them, Listen to me, O men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. Just warning them ahead of time, saying, What you've done is the most stupid. However, once the trees went forth to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Shall I leave my fatness, with which God and men are honored, and go to wave over the trees? But the trees said, rather, then the trees said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. The fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit, and go wave over the, the trees? Well, the trees then said to the vine, You come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I leave my new wine, with which God cheers, sorry, which cheers God and men, to go wave over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the bramble, a, a, a thick thorn bush, You reign over us, you be our king. The bramble said to the trees, <laughs> If in truth you are anointing me as king over you, oh, come and take refuge in my shade, the shade of a, of a bush. But if not, may fire come out from the bramble and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if you have dealt in truth and integrity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jubael and his house, because they, they deserved better than that, better than what they got, and have dealt with him as he deserved. Again, this is sarcasm. He knows he was there. For my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you from the hand of Midian, again, at the command of God. But you have risen against my father's house today and have killed his sons, 70 men, who have done nothing deserving death from them, on one stone and have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, not even his wife, his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, simply because he is your relative. If then you have dealt in truth and integrity with Jerubael and his house this day, rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume the men of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and Beth Milo and consume Abimelech. Basically, I hope you guys destroy each other. Then Jotham escaped and fled and went to Beer and remained there because of Abimelech, his brother. He literally ran away, which is probably the wisest thing he could possibly do, since he was the last son of Jerubbaal left. Now, Abimelech ruled over Israel for three years. Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, so that the violence done to the seventy sons of Jerubbaal might come, 
and their blood might be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem, who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers. The men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who might pass by them along the road, and it was told to Abimelech. Now Gael, the son of Ebed, came with his relatives and crossed over into Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their trust into him. And they went out into the field and gathered their grapes of, of the vineyard and trod them, and held a festival. And they went into the house of their god, right, their god, and ate and drank and cursed Abimelech. Then Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech, and who is Shechem, that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jerubael? And is not Zebel his lieutenant? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? Would, therefore, that this people would be under my authority. Then I would remove Abimelech. And he said to Abimelech, Increase your army and come out. When Zebel, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gael, the son of Ebed, his anger burned. He sent messengers to Abimelech deceitfully, saying, Behold, Gael the son of Ebed and his relatives have come to Shechem, and behold, they're stirring up the city against you. Now therefore, arise by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. In the morning, as soon as the sun is up, you shall rise early and rush upon the city. And behold, when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you shall do to them whatever you can. So Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night and lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. Now Gael the son of Ebed went out and stood in the entrance of the city gate, and Abimelech and the people who were with him arose from the ambush. When Gael saw the people, he said to Zebel, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. But Zebel said to him, you're, you're just seeing the shadow of the mountains, uh, as if they were men. Well, Gael spoke again and said, but behold, people are coming down from the highest parts of the land, and one company comes by the way of the diviner's oak. Then Zebel said to him, <laughs> Where is your boasting now with which you said, Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Is not this the people whom you despised? Go out now and fight with them. So Gael went out before the leaders of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many fell wounded up to the entrance of the gate. Then Abimelech reigned, or sorry, remained at Aruma, and Zebel drove out Gael and his uh, relatives, so that they would, uh, so sorry, so that they could not remain at Shechem. Now it came about the next day that the people went out to the field, and it was told to Abimelech, and he took his people and divided them into three companies and lay in wait in the field. When he looked and saw the people coming out of the city, he rose against them and slew them. Then Abimelech and the company who was with him dashed forward and stood in the entrance of the city gate. The other two companies then dashed all those who were in the field and slew them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He captured the city and killed the people who were in it. Then he raised the city and sowed it with salt. Uh, when you sow something with salt, when you sow the ground with salt, nothing can grow there again. He's basically turning it into a waste. When all the leaders of the tower of Shechem heard of it, well, they entered the inner chamber of the temple of el Bereth. It was told uh, Abimelech that all the leaders of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. So Abimelech, uh, sorry, Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down... I uh, lost my spot. There we go. Um... Nope. Ah, there we go. Took an axe in his hand and cut down a branch from the trees and lifted it and laid it on his shoulder. Then he said to the people who were with him, What you have seen me do, hurry and do likewise. And all, uh, yeah, all the people also cut down each one his branch and followed Abimelech. They put them on the inner chamber and set the inner chamber on fire uh, for, sorry, over those inside, so that the men of the tower of Shechem also died, about a thousand men and women. Then Abimelech went to Thebes, and he camped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower in the center of the city, and all the women and children and the men and all the leaders of the city fled there and shut themselves in, and they went up on the roof of the tower. 
So Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and approached the entrance of the tower to burn it with fire. But a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head, crushing his skull. Then he uh, called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, so that it will not be said of me, a woman slew him. So the young man pierced him through, and he died. When the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, each departed to his home. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father in killing his seventy brothers. God also returned all the wickedness of the men of Shechem, who hired him to do so, on their own heads, and the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbaal, came upon them. Bring up the notes here. And that is it. Let's go on to Acts chapter 13. The first missionary journey. Now, there were at Antioch, uh, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have, or to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salome, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. That's John Mark. When they had gone through the whole land, or the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was the proconsul, um, yeah, who was with the proconsul, sorry, uh, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elisimus, the magician, for, ho sir, sir, blah, 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 for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who also was known as Paul, and heretofore shall be referred to as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You, who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not be able to see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law, the prophets, uh, the, uh, the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, "Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it." So Paul stood up, and motioning with his hand, said. Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out of it. For a period of about 40 years, he appeared, sorry, he put up with them, which is an accurate statement, uh, with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance all of which took about 450 years. After, the, rather, after these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. We're in the book of Judges now. Samuel comes next. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. 
from the descendants of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed, uh, um, after John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, Who do you suppose that I am? I am not he, the, the coming Messiah. But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am unworthy to untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. For many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And now we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to your rather to our children, and that he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he was raised up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and did I lost my spot. It was laid among his fathers and did undergo decay. He underwent this decay. He died and rotted in a cave. But he whom God raised did not undergo, de uh, undergo decay because he brought life back into him. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that he, rather that through him, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you this one whom God has sent, this Jesus the Christ. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which you cannot be freed through the law of Moses. Paul later goes on into this in detail in the book of Romans, which we'll get to in today's, uh, 15 days. Therefore, take heed, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you, Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. You know, this would have been a perfect spot to put in where they led them through the sinner's prayer with somebody in the background playing on the piano. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw these crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first since you repudiate it and, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and leading men of the city 
and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. And the disciples were continually filled with, rather, filled with joy. I I missed my spot. Uh, There we go. Uh, But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Bringing up the rest of the notes for you here. And that is all of them. Let's go on to Jeremiah 22. Thus says the Lord, Go down to the house of the king of Judah, and there speak this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, who sits on David's throne, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, Do justice and righteousness, and deliver the one who has been robbed from the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. I totally skipped over a whole section. All right, so do justice and righteousness and deliver the one who has been robbed of the power of his oppressor. And do not mistreat uh, mistreat or do violence to the stranger, the orphan, or the widow. And do not shed innocent blood in this place. For if you men will indeed perform this thing, then kings will enter the gates of this house, sitting in David's place on his throne, riding in chariots and on horses, even the king himself and his servants and his people. But if you will not obey these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, who can swear by nothing higher, that this house will become a house of desolation. For thus says the Lord concerning the house of the, of the king of Judah, You are like Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon. Yet most assuredly, I will make you like a wilderness, like cities which are not inhabited. For I will set apart destroyers against you, each with his weapons, and they will cut down your choicest cedars and throw them on the fire. Many nations will pass by the city, and they will say to one another, Why has the Lord done thus to this great city? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the covenant of the Lord their God, and bowed down to other gods and served them. Do not weep for the dead or mourn for him, but weep continually for the one who goes away, for he will never return or see his native land. For thus says the Lord in regard to Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who became king in the place of Josiah his father, who went forth from this place. He will never return there. But in the place where they led him captive, there he will die and not see this land again. Woe to him who builds his house without righteousness, and his upper rooms without justice, who uses his neighbor's services without pay and does not give him his wages, who says, I will build myself a roomy house with spacious upper rooms and cut out its windows paneling it with cedar and and painting it bright red. Do you become a king because you are competing in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He pled the cause of of the afflicted and needy. Then it was well. Is not that, rather, is not that what it means to know me, declares the Lord? But your eyes and your heart are intent only upon your own dishonest gain and on shedding innocent blood and on practicing oppression and extortion. Therefore, thus says the Lord in regard to Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they will not lament for him. Alas, my brother, or alas, my sister, they will not lament for him. Alas, for the master, or alas, for his splendor. He will be buried with a donkey's burial, dragged off and thrown out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Go up to Lebanon and cry out, and lift up your voice in Bashan. Cry out also from Abarim, and for all your lovers have been crushed. I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not listen. 
This has been your practice from your youth, that you have not obeyed my voice. The wind will sweep away all your shepherds, and your lovers will go into captivity. And you will surely be ashamed and humiliated because of all your wickedness. You who dwell in Lebanon, nested in the cedars, how you will groan when pangs come upon you, like, rather, pain like a woman in childbirth. As I live. Literally, it's, this will only not happen if I die. Again, this is God who lives in eternity, who can never die. Declares the Lord, even though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were, were a signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pull you off. And I will give you over into the, into the hand of those who are seeking your life. Yes, into the hand of those whom you dread, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the army of the Chaldeans. I will hurl you and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you will die. But as for the land to which they desire to return, they will not return to it. Is this man, Coniah, a despised, shattered jar? Or is he an undesirable vessel? Why have he and his descendants been hurled out and cast into a land that they have not known? O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write down this man childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David, or ruling again in Judah. Let's go into Mark chapter 8 here. In those days, when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I was to send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a great distance. And his disciples answered him, Where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this, in this desolate place to satisfy these people? And he was directing them, or rather he was asking them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground, and taking the seven loaves, he once again gave thanks and broke them, and started giving them to his disciples to serve them. And they served to all the people. And they also had a few small fish, and after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate and were satisfied, and they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. About 4,000 people were there, and he sent them away. Immediately, he entered into the boat with his disciples and came to the, to the district of Dalmuntha. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, uh, seeking from him a sign from heaven so as to test him. Uh, if, if you're really the Son of God, then, then show me something in the stars, or show me something in the sky so that I would believe in you. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. They had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving them orders, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Well, they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? When I broke up the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? They said to him, Twelve. When I broke the seven for the four thousand, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said again to him, Seven. And he was saying to them, Do you not yet understand? 
In one of the other Gospels, it goes into a little bit more detail, and it said, then, aha, then they understood that he was talking about the leaven of the Pharisees as that which is um, sinfulness. He wasn't talking about actual food. And they came to Beth, sorry, to Beth, they came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. And taking the, the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again he laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored, and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Because again, everybody would know this guy who was born blind. Jesus went out, along with his disciples, uh, to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do the people say that I am? Well, they told him, saying, Well, John the Baptist, or, or others say Elijah, but others say one of the prophets. So he continued questioning them. But who do you say that I am. And Peter answered and said to him, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began at this point to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days he would rise again. And he was stating the, na the, sorry, the matter plainly. Well, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Oh, Lord, this will not happen to you. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Again, we talked about this before, but the fact of the matter is that, that Peter, like all the other disciples, was expecting Jesus to be this, this great um, national ruler. This is why a lot of them were flocking to him. Because if he was going to be the Messiah, well, the Messiah they'd been sworn about was coming, was going to be a great military leader who was going to come tromping into Jerusalem, and he was going to destroy um, all, of the, uh, all of the people who had put themselves over the Jewish people and over the Jewish race, and he was going to lift up the Jewish people to the, to the pinnacle of all of creation. And then they would be able to rule over all of the nations with an iron fist and just completely crush all the people who have been keeping them down. It's this whole Christus Victor kind of thing that they were expecting to see. But that's not who Jesus is. At least not in this point. He will come again with an iron rod in his hand, and he will utterly dash everyone to pieces who does not believe in him, who does not trust in him. But when he first came, he was coming to defeat their biggest and their worst enemy, which is death. And he did that by, by paying the price for their sins in their place. But they didn't understand this yet. This is why it's necessary that Jesus has to die, that he has to be the, the, the pure, spotless lamb of the Passover so that those who are in him will be saved by God. We'll see this come up again, because this is a continuing thing they keep running into, even to the day where Jesus is... is um, taken away from them. And then even after that, when Jesus is talking to them after his resurrection, they ask him, well, when, when, when are you going to take over the, 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 the throne? When can we rule with you? The only time they stop talking about this is after they're filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Kind of cool. Or is it Acts chapter 1? I thought it was 2. I could be wrong. Anyway, let's move on. So he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. He must deny all that he is, his dreams, his aspirations, everything he wants to be. He must reject all of these things and trust in God. And then he must take up his cross 
which again, you remember that's not like we see it today as, Oh yeah, I took up my cross and you know, someone flipped me off from the parking lot. No, you are going to die most likely in a public execution in this day and age when he's speaking to them simply for believing in Christ. In fact, that's how 11 of the 12 apostles are killed in public executions. That's why he says, you must take up your cross and follow me. He's saying, it. look, if you think that I'm going to lead you into king's palaces to rule over people, this is not the thing for you. This is not going to happen in the way that you think it will. You must utterly reject everything about who you are. Now, he's not saying um, that you need to go and sell all your property. He does say that to one person, but that's a guy who, who whose idol was his stuff, right? He's not saying that everybody needs to just sell everything that they have and live in a tent somewhere. He's not saying that at all, right? Um, but what he is saying is that you need to be willing to give it all up. If God calls you into the ministry and you've got this great job as, as, as um, I don't know, a, a carpenter or, or a lawyer or whatever it happens to be, you need to be willing to give up that job and that lifestyle and everything that comes with it to go and serve God and become a pastor, even if your friends and your family mock you for it. You need to be willing to give that up. That's what he's trying to say. For whoever wishes to save his life, your life you have today, if this is all you want, if that's the focus for you is keeping that one thing, then you need to be willing to give that up. But if you aren't willing to do so, if it's more important to you to have your, your earthly things or the, the life you now have, you will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save his actual life. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? If you had the possibility to, to gain every bit of wealth in the entire planet just for yourself, what is the point of all of that if you still lose your soul in the end? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he, the Son of Man, comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is what you expected to see. This is what you expected. He's talking to his uh, disciples. This is what you expected to see me doing and me coming to you with all of this pomp and circumstance and, and the ruling and, and the, um, in the fury of God, you will not see that today. That's his point. But if you're unwilling to follow me even in the little things today, then I will deny you because you don't really love me. All right, that's it for today. Let's go on to, uh, to tomorrow. We'll see what we have. That'll be fun. Behold the word of the Lord. <laughs>